IB Bio, Ecology Conservation Option C Part 5, will focus on various impacts of people on ecosystems. First, we will examine invasive species. Secondly, we will look at the impact of non-degradable toxins, such as DDT, on food chains. And we'll discuss the relationship of the ban of DDT on the incidence of malaria. And lastly, we will examine the plastic pollution problem. The essential idea is human activities impact ecosystem function. Here is the outline of available movies for the IB Bio Ecology Conservation Option C series. Choose the movie you need for review. This movie is focused right here. Here are the IB syllabus statements that kick off this movie. Introduced alien species can escape into local ecosystems and become invasive. Competitive exclusion and the absence of predators can lead to reduction in the numbers of endemic species when alien species become invasive. Invasive species, also known as non-native species or alien species, are introduced to an ecosystem accidentally or purposefully by people. Without natural biological predators or disease, invasive species exclude native species. They spread rapidly and reduce local diversity. Invasive species could be thought of as a biotic pollution. Here are some examples of non-native invasive species that have reduced the diversity of the ecosystems into which they've been introduced. The brown tree snake, by way of example, has been introduced to various islands in the Pacific, such as Guam. The snake has spread rapidly without natural biological predators or disease. The brown tree snake has decimated bird populations as it eats the eggs. Alien species become invasive species because they're colonizers, they have a high dispersal rate, they're generalists, they're well adapted to a broad range of conditions. The zebra mussel was introduced to the Great Lakes of the United States by ships reaching the lakes from overseas. The zebra mussel spread rapidly, clogging the drains of water systems that access the lakes. Water hyacinth, seen here in Uganda, is an alien species that has become invasive. Water hyacinth grows abundantly in the waterways of the world. The hyacinth, as a floating plant, blocks sunlight from reaching depth. And water hyacinth blocks shallow bays and requires removal, as can be seen here. Removing invasive species can be expensive, and species already lost from the system may never return. The kudzu is an alien species that has entered the southern United States to become invasive. The kudzu vine overgrows other species, outcompeting them for light, ultimately killing the species on which the kudzu grows. The kudzu costs the United States $137 billion a year in eradication programs. Prosopis juliflora is an alien species that has become invasive in India. Prosopis was introduced to India from Mexico. Prosopis grows rapidly in a dry environment using its deep roots to get groundwater. Prosopis outcompetes native species, reducing local diversity. Alien species become invasive as a result of competitive exclusion, which leads to the reduction in the numbers of endemic species. New Zealand has a high proportion of ground nesting and flightless birds due to the long geographical isolation and a natural lack of mammalian predators. However, in recent years, bird species in New Zealand have declined because of the stoat, an alien species that has become invasive. The stoat is a member of the weasel family, a family that includes ferrets. It was introduced to New Zealand in the 1880s to control rabbits and hares. Stoats are now considered public enemy number one for New Zealand birds, most of which are endemic. Nine out of ten New Zealand birds are unique to New Zealand, and about 800 bird species are at significant risk of extinction. Stoats are implicated in the extinction of some indigenous bird species such as the bush wren, laughing owl, and the native thrush. And the stoat is responsible for the decline of other species, including various kiwi species. The Department of Conservation in New Zealand is implementing the Battle for Our Birds Predator Control Program aimed at eradicating the stoat. This is a photograph I took in New Zealand of the traps used to kill the stoats. The cost of removing stoats is about a hundred million US dollars per year and in 2015 the government has set aside an extra 6.6 .6 million for more research 
on ways to control the stoats. Eliminating stoats is expensive. Here is a photograph of a DOC employee readying to take traps into the field. The labor cost in stoat elimination programs is one of the largest costs. In addition to traps, the DOC in New Zealand uses poison, a poison known as 1080. Poison 1080 is theoretically biodegradable, but there is evidence that other species are harmed if not killed. People are worried about 1080 entering the food chain or entering water supplies. But data supports that continuous stoat trapping and the use of 1080 poison has boosted the population of endangered mohua in certain locations. So the trapping, along with the poison, works to eliminate non-native species. The Department of Conservation puts up signs warning of the use of poison. You can see the poison here. And others put up signs making an argument against the poison. And political cartoonists make fun of the idea that removing the stoat is an environmentally friendly action, a green action by spreading poison. There is a play on the use of the word green in this cartoon. Stoats are difficult to control since they are bait shy, trap wary, and have a high birth rate. The trap known as a stoat tunnel is a wooden box with a small entrance that allows the stoat to enter. The bait's an egg and a metal trap kills the stoat. Should we be ethically concerned in killing stoats? Is there any real probability of eliminating stoats altogether from New Zealand? Is the money spent worth the costs? Is the money spent to eradicate the stoat worth the gain in biodiversity? Are there alternatives to poison 1080 or the traps? Predator-proof fences using a fine wire mesh are being used in some protected areas. As well, methods of restricting stoat breeding are also being investigated. Here are additional IB syllabus statements relevant to our look at invasive species. The cane toad in Australia provides an example of the introduction of an alien species. Evaluate the eradication program of an invasive species. I've spoken about the eradication attempts in New Zealand. The cane toad, native to South America, is an invasive species in various locations around the world, including Australia. Australia's relative isolation as an island continent means that there are no natural predators for the cane toads. Cane toads were introduced to Australia from Hawaii in 1935 as a biological control mechanism in an attempt to control the native gray-backed cane beetle and the Frenchie beetle. The use of a biological control like the toad was viewed as a better option than spraying chemicals that would kill the beetles as well as other unintended animals. Competitive exclusion and the absence of predators of the cane toad has led to the reduction in the numbers of endemic species in Australia as the alien species, the toad, has become invasive. Since the release of a few hundred toads in limited locations, toads have rapidly multiplied in population and now number over 200 million, with a range of more than 500,000 square kilometers. The introduction of the toads has caused a loss of local diversity, and there's little evidence that the toads have had any impact on the cane beetles that they were introduced to predate. The Australian government has labeled the cane toad as a key threatening agent under the Environment Protection of Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999. The most widely used strategy to remove cane toads involves traps, but the traps also capture unintended native species. As well, toads quickly recolonize areas where toads have been removed. Another suggested strategy involves the release of sterile males into the population. These males would compete for resources with other males while themselves not being able to reproduce. This method has not yet been attempted. Another possible strategy would be to insert a gene in female toads that would result in producing only male offspring. In theory, this would limit reproductive rates and control the population. Once again, this method has not yet been attempted. Another strategy would be to use a chemical produced by the toad to which the, the toad tadpoles are attracted. Researchers could use cane toad chemical to successfully lure the cane toad tadpoles for capture and eradication. Remember, the use of a biological control such as the toad to get rid of a pest species is advantageous to the spraying of pesticides which might harm many different species and get into the food chain of people, but too frequently alien biological controls become invasive. Eradication programs cost the Australian government millions of dollars per year. 
The Pest Animal Control Cooperative Research Center recently estimated that the direct cost of rabbits, another invasive species, to the Australian economy at $113 million per year, but other estimates have suggested that the costs could be much higher, closer to $600 million per year. Homeowners, average citizens are allowed to kill toads, but there are laws against inhumane methods, such as bludgeoning the animals or using sprays that might harm other species. Should we be ethically concerned in killing toads? Is there any real probability of eliminating toads from Australia? Is the money spent worth the costs? Is the money spent to eradicate the toad worth the gain in biodiversity? Will one of the potential eradication methods ultimately be successful? When the niches of two species overlap, competitive exclusion comes into play. Competitive exclusion can lead to the reduction in the numbers of endemic species when alien species become invasive. Nile perch was intentionally introduced to Lake Victoria in 1962 for commercial fishing purposes due to its significant size with masses up to 200 kilograms. Once introduced, it reproduced enormously and spread throughout several aquatic environments in Africa. The Nile perch has been responsible for a significant decline in native fish species, particularly various species of cichlids. According to the IUCN's Invasive Species Specialist Group, the Nile perch is considered one of the world's worst 100 invasive species. Competitive exclusion in the absence of predators has led to the reduction in the numbers of endemic species as the alien Nile perch has become invasive. The Nile perch is a dominant predatory fish. They reproduce in large numbers with the potential of 16 million eggs in one reproductive episode. As a predator, the Nile perch feeds on their own species as well as others, including crustaceans, mollusks, and insects. As the fish grows, it is able to prey on fish of different sizes. Thus, it can have a catastrophic effect on many species that it encounters as it moves from area to area in search of food. While the perch have provided food, their size has required stronger fires on which to cook the animal. Thus, deforestation. Deforestation has resulted in changes to the quality of the water, making the water more turbid, less clear. Both the Nile perch and the turbidity of the water due to deforestation have had negative impacts on the other fish species, the cichlids. The introduction of the Nile perch has created a small fishing industry. The Nile perch provides food for people and the fishing industry provides employment. And as it turns out, commercial fishing is currently the only control method for the Nile perch in Lake Victoria. Over the past 20 years, the quantity of Nile perch caught in Lake Victoria, as a percentage of total fish caught, has slowly been declining, and several species of fish that had declined due to the introduction of the perch are showing some increasing numbers. Competitive exclusion and the absence of predators can lead to reductions in the number of endemic species when alien species become invasive. Invasive species cause a decline in endemic species because of competitive exclusion. Two species cannot occupy the same niche for an extended period of time. Given enough time, one species will outcompete the other for resources. I've come back to this IB syllabus statement to strengthen the second part, the evaluation of biological control as a measure to reduce the impact of an alien species. Let's start the evaluation of biological control of species by mentioning that too often, invasive species were originally introduced as a form of biological control of another pest species. The cane toad was introduced to Australia in an attempt to control the native gray-backed cane beetle and the Frenchy beetle. The use of a species for biological control of another species may backfire when the alien species becomes invasive. A small wasp was introduced to the U.S. from China to help control the European corn borer. The mite was used in citrus agriculture to control the thrips, an insect that reduces orange crop production. Rabbits, like most other invasive species, were introduced to Australia when the Europeans first settled there. Rabbits were introduced from two main sources, the domesticated rabbit, which provided early settlers with a ready source of meat, and the wild rabbit introduced later for hunting. Biological control measures have been attempted with rabbits. In 1950, the myxomatosis virus initially wiped out between 95 and 100% of the rabbits in some areas. However, rabbits recovered 
with the development of resistance in many populations, and rabbits remain as one of Australia's most formidable invasive species. Classical biological control of a pest is long-lasting and inexpensive. Other than the initial costs of collection, importation, and rearing, little expense is incurred. When a natural enemy is successfully established, it rarely requires additional input, and it continues to kill the pest with no direct help from humans and at no cost. However, the importation of biological control does not always work. It is usually most effective against exotic pests and less so against native insect pests. The reason for failure are not often known, but may include the release of too few individuals or poor adaptation of the natural enemy to the environmental conditions at the release location. As well, it's quite possible that the introduced biological control species becomes invasive. So in terms of biological control, the advantages are it's highly specific, does not harm non-target species, it's inexpensive, no environmental pollution, no poisons sprayed into the environment, and works over a long period of time. The disadvantages are does not always work. The introduced species does not eat what it was intended to eat. The introduced species eats what it was not intended to eat and could become invasive, reducing local diversity, and it could disrupt the local food chain. Interestingly, most of our staple food crops are non-native in the locations where we grow them. Are they invasive? This movie's primary focus has been the impact of humans on ecosystems. With the impact of humans as the thread that holds this movie together, here are the next two IB syllabus statements. Pollutants become concentrated in the tissues of organisms at higher trophic levels by biomagnification. Analyze data illustrating the causes and consequences of biomagnification. Biomagnification is defined as the increase in the concentration of persistent non-biodegradable toxic molecules along a food chain. DDT is an insecticide used to kill mosquitoes or other insects that disrupt agricultural production. Toxins such as DDT that are not biodegradable or not broken down by the metabolism of organisms can accumulate in the bodies of individual organisms at particular trophic levels. Then, as one trophic level feeds on another, the toxins magnify in concentration, as you can see here, from 0.04 ppm to 0.5 to 2 to 25 ppm. Because fish eat many zooplankton and predatory birds eat many fish. The most important concept in understanding biomagnification is that the toxin, whether it be DDT or mercury, PCBs or other, is not degraded or excreted by the body. Thus, the toxin is stored in the body of individual organisms and accumulates there. Then, as it will be with food chains, the toxin increases in concentration up the food chain. The concentration of the toxin is magnified at the highest trophic levels. As a result, the adverse effects of toxins are often seen first at the top of the food chain. Mercury is an industrial pollutant that's often discarded into the waterways of the world, and it also accumulates up the food chain. Mercury accumulates in the bodies of individuals and then magnifies up the chain, and people preferring to eat high on aquatic food chains eat the tuna and become exposed to high levels of mercury. Mercury can affect human health in many ways. This diagram displays how the concentration of the toxin, DDT or mercury or PCB or others, can be magnified to the top of the food chain. Ultimately, the magnification of the toxin is first seen in the top carnivores as their population numbers decline as a result of the toxin. The impact of the toxin can take many forms in different species. This is a graph that shows peregrine falcon eggshell thickness across time with the introduction of DDT here. The introduction of DDT is correlated with a decrease in eggshell thickness in predatory birds. The thinner shells meant that roosting females would cause shells to break. The thinner shell reduced successful reproduction. 
falcon populations declined. Similar data was gathered for other predatory birds, such as the sparrowhawk, indicating the negative impact of DDT on top carnivores. Following the Second World War, DDT was used widely to control insects in agricultural fields as well as control mosquitoes that transmitted disease. As a result of biomagnification, top predators such as peregrine falcons suffered and the breeding pairs declined from 1960 to 1976. People became concerned that DDT was entering the human food chain. Rachel Carson's well-known book titled Silent Spring highlighted the health problems associated with widespread DDT use. DDT was banned in the United States in 1972, and as you can see here then, peregrine falcon populations rebounded. This graph shows the number of territories occupied by the peregrine falcon across time, and from 1972 when DDT was banned in North America, peregrine falcon populations increased dramatically. And that brings us to the next IB syllabus statement. Discuss the trade-off between the control of the malarial parasite and DDT pollution. DDT is an organochlorine insecticide that, as a poison, acts as a neurotoxin in insects. Following the Second World War, DDT was used widely to control insects in agricultural fields as well as control mosquitoes that transmitted malaria. It was not uncommon to see DDT being sprayed in neighborhoods, as you can see here, and wooded areas where mosquitoes would breed. In 1962, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. Carson speculated that DDT had entered the human food chain causing cancer, and the politics surrounding her speculation resulted in the ban of DDT in the U.S. 10 years later. Various studies supported Carson's claim that DDT was accumulating in the tissues of organisms with the potential of entering the human food chain. Here is a graph from the World Health Organization republished by Environmental Health News that displays worldwide malarial deaths in millions from 19th century all the way to 2009. This graph suggests that DDT spraying was effective in reducing malarial deaths. Malarial deaths before 1940 were high, while deaths dropped considerably after DDT spraying was initiated. Interestingly, malarial deaths in Africa did not decrease as malarial spraying became common. In fact, one might argue that malarial deaths in Africa increased through this period of time. The increase in malarial deaths seen here comes as a result of drug resistance, resistance to DDT by mosquitoes, something you should understand from our studies of evolution. Here's an image of a mosquito net being sprayed with an insecticide. This graph displays the DDT house spraying rate shown by this curve and the number of cumulative malarial deaths in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela shown by this curve between the years 1965 and 1995. The data in this graph suggests that malarial deaths increased as DDT house spraying decreased. The data in this graph displays the concentration of DDT in the breast milk of Swedish women from 1965 to 1995. The graph shows that the quantity of DDT in the breast milk of Swedish women declined after 1972, although there were declines prior to 1972 when DDT was banned. The data in this graph suggests that Rachel Carson's fears about DDT entering the human food chain had merit. So here are the questions for you to discuss. Does DDT reduce malaria? Does DDT increase agricultural yield, allowing us to grow more food for a growing population? Does DDT magnify in food chains? Has DDT entered the human food chain? Does DDT harm humans? Does DDT decrease biodiversity by killing unintended species? But here's the big one. Is the banning of DDT ethical if DDT prevents people from suffering malaria? So in following the thread of human impact on ecosystems, here is our last IB syllabus statement. Macroplastic and microplastic debris has accumulated in marine environments. 
approximately 8 million tons of plastic per year end up in the oceans, from plastic bags to bottles to microbeads to small pieces of plastic broken down from larger sources. This graph displays the top 10 sources of plastic that ends up in the ocean. The U.S. and Europe rank far down the list of ocean plastic pollution because of recycling programs. Here are images of the Laysan albatross. The Laysan albatross is a large seabird with a wingspan of 2 meters. The Laysan albatross ranges across the North Pacific. The albatross accidentally eats plastic, mistaking it for food. The ingestion of plastic is made worse by the way the Laysan albatross feeds, skimming the water with their beak, thus accidentally picking up floating plastic. Adult birds, upon regurgitation, feed their chicks plastic. Chicks do not readily regurgitate, so plastic fills their stomachs and gizzards and chicks die of starvation. Studies suggest that the Laysan albatross ingests a greater variety of plastic and more plastic than any other bird. Here are four photos by Chris Jordan displaying plastic in the stomachs of dead albatross birds. Here is an image displaying the range of size in plastic pieces found in the ocean alongside an image of a dead Laysan albatross with plastic in its stomach. Microbeads and microplastics used in various bathing products have entered water supplies. Data is being collected on the harm caused to organisms that ingest the microbeads. Animals of all sizes have ingested plastic as can be seen here with the illuminated green pieces in the guts of these animals. You can see the plastic found in the stomach of this fish. So in case you missed it, I've just presented a short case study on the impact of marine plastic debris on the Laysan albatross. I will let you research a second species harmed by marine plastic debris. The IB syllabus statement is examine the impact of marine plastic debris on the Laysan albatross and one other named species. And that brings us to the end of IB Biology, Ecology and Conservation, Option C, Part 5.